Plasma cells are descendants of activated B cells and function predominantly as antibody factories. Knowing that these cells are antibody factories, what would we expect to see in their cytoplasm? You've got it. Lots of rough endoplasmic reticulum, as well as a very well-developed Golgi apparatus. As you can see here, plasma cells have an off-center nucleus, which is sometimes described as a fried egg appearance. It's hard to see in this image, but other features include chromatin in a clock phase distribution. You can imagine the numbers on the outer edge of the nucleus. The numbers I'm referring to here represent heterochromatin that is condensed and placed at the outer edge of the nucleus. Now can you point to the plasma cells in this picture? There are a good many on this slide, and this is a great example of a clock face chromatin in areas of overdeveloped endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus used in antibody production. The plasma cell is also the center of pathology in multiple myeloma, and we'll discuss this later on in the pathology section of this chapter. Alright, so now let's try a question. We have a 62-year-old man that is admitted to the hospital for workup of a one-month history of fatigue. Physical exam reveals an unsteady gait and decreased vibration and position sense in the L4-L5 distribution bilaterally. Laboratory studies reveal a hematocrit of 29%, white blood cells at 7,100, platelets at 240,000, and an MCV at 123. A peripheral smear is obtained and shown here. Which of the following is the most likely cause of this patient's low hematocrit? You have A, anemia of chronic disease. B. Autoimmune hemolytic anemia. C. Folate deficiency. D. Hereditary spherocytosis. E. Iron deficiency anemia. And F. Pernicious anemia. Well, the answer here is pernicious anemia. F. Did you get that one right? If so, great job. If not, don't worry about it. That's what we're here for. So how do you approach your assembly style question? Do you read from the first sentence down, or do you look at the last line first? Or do you have some other method that you use? If you're anything like I was when I was studying for step one, you don't really have a method. You just work the question. You read the question, you pick an answer, and you move on. Well, while this is one way to do it, there are many other ways to approach these questions, and I would suggest developing an approach to each question. While this may seem a little over the top and a little cumbersome at first, if you develop a way to approach questions, and you approach them that way every single time, you can really cut down on dumb mistakes and simple oversights. Here, I'll show you how I approach questions. And if you like it, you can try it for yourself. If not, I suggest you come up with your own way to approach questions so you can really crush on test day. The first thing I always did was look at the answers. I've got to pick one of these answers, so I might as well look at them and know what I'm working with. So when I look at these answer choices, what do I see? Well, the question will likely be talking about some kind of anemia, as four of the six answers have anemia in the answer choice. I see folate deficiency, which I usually contrast with B12 deficiency, which I do not see at first glance. At this point in time, this will usually make me think, where's B12 deficiency? This is likely the most important step in the process that I use. Instead of starting out with information input by reading the question, I start out by thinking of what the question is likely to say. After using this method for a while, I realize that this keeps me from shortcutting the question to the first thing that looks good, or the first thing that I think of when I read the question. During this process, I would review the answers and realize, oh yeah, pernicious anemia. That can cause B12 deficiency. So there's my substitute for B12 deficiency. I would also go quickly through the remaining choices and say, what would the question stem need to say for me to pick that answer? For example, if the answer were autoimmune hemolytic anemia, I would expect to see hemolytic labs, like an elevated LDH or an elevated indirect bilirubin, or maybe a low haptoglobin, or a very elevated reticulocyte count, suggesting rapid cell turnover. So what about for iron deficiency anemia? What would I expect to see? Well, how about a classic iron deficiency anemia presentation, like a young female with heavy monthly bleeding or older male with suspected colon cancer? For iron deficiency anemia, what would I expect my lab work to show? Maybe an anemia with a low MCV and some iron studies that suggested an iron deficiency anemia. After I thought through most of the answer choices quickly, I would then read the question. So for our question here, we've got an older guy with fatigue. He also has some nerve issues and anemia and a very elevated MCV. We also get a picture, and what do we see in our picture? A hypersegmented neutrophil with lots of lobes. First off, iron deficiency anemia is usually microcytic, so I'd scratch that one off. For anemia of chronic disease and autoimmune hemolytic anemia, these are usually normocytic, and they normally don't have nerve-related issues, so I'd eliminate these two. For hereditary spherocytosis, 
I would expect to see a normal cystic anemia and a spherocyte on my image. While I may or may not have been able to call a spherocyte on the picture, you can tell in the image that they are focused on the neutrophil, so this makes hereditary spherocytosis very unlikely. So now we're down to folate deficiency and pernicious anemia. At this point, I would be using pernicious anemia as my sub for B12 deficiency. And considering this, I would approach it this way. Well, both B12 deficiency and folate deficiency can cause a hypersegmented neutrophil. Both can cause an anemia with elevated MCV, but only B12 deficiency gives you the nerve-related issues. After I did all that, I would select my answer and move on. I wouldn't mark it or come back later because I knew I'd done everything I could to help me think of the correct answer. While this process may have seemed a little simplistic for this question, if you develop your own method and apply it to all the questions you work and do this over time, it can really be beneficial on test day. So if you like this video, give us a big thumbs up below. And if you have any comments or suggestions, please let us know. We're looking to improve any way we can. Well, this is Dan Griffin signing off, and I'll see you in the next video.